Hi everyone, thank you for joining the webinar. I can see a few more people are just coming in, so um, we can we can get started, and obviously they can join as um, as we go. So. Um, just want to say a big thank you to everyone joining us for our first Hospitality Marketing Masterclass. Um, this one is titled Mastering Your Messaging and it's aimed to provide you with um, the tools and strategies to implement yourselves um, to, to, to create your own stories within your marketing, um, which is what Anna will be going through today. Um, just to give you a little bit of information on why we've started these um, webinars, we've developed the programme to um, for all hospitality um, industry companies to provide support um, for those specific independent hospitality businesses that are going through this change at the moment. Obviously, um, these are very challenging times. So we will be holding these three masterclasses weekly um, and we hope to see as many of you um, of them on them as possible. Um, our first session, as I mentioned earlier, is um, being led by Anna, who is our account manager at Custard Communications. Um, on the back of her incredibly um, popular session at Comfex, Anna is going to be sharing her expertise on implementing effective brand messaging, um, portraying your authenticity and sharing your stories throughout your marketing. So that's what you'll be learning today. Um, and this webinar is being recorded. So if there's anything you miss or you need to drop out, um, we will send you up a follow up link um, and it will be available on YouTube for you as well. Um, so just to let you know, all your mics are currently on mute, but we are um, running a Q&A and chat box. So feel free to ask us any questions that you have through the Q&A box. Um, me and my colleague Petra will be answering these as much as possible throughout the session. Um, and also there'll be a few for Anna to answer live. So please feel free to get in touch as much as possible. Um, and yeah, so I'd like to hand over to Anna, um, who will be leading the session today. Thank you very much. Morning, everybody. Um, so as Georgia mentioned, the first of our sessions today is looking at how to master your marketing and your messaging, not only now um, in unknown territory to a lot of us as far as marketing is concerned, among many other things, but also going forwards once business resumes and we return to work and um, your venues, your hotels open again. So we're looking at transferable skills really in in the messaging that can kind of be brought forward to a time when more than ever you're going to need to stand out in a crowd amongst your competitors. So we're looking at how to establish your brand personality within your messaging. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have the same questions at the moment about what's right to say, what you should avoid saying. We're going to look specifically at how to say things, um, the tone, how you identify the personality of your brand, and how you communicate that on different platforms going forward. So firstly, to understand what storytelling even is in marketing. I'm sure a lot of you have seen examples of people fabricating stories um, to make them sound more interesting. I personally am not guilty of it, but I have many friends that are. Um, it's important to realise that a good story doesn't have to be fictional um, in marketing. And it's more about knowing your audience, who you're selling to or who you're communicating with, being clear on where the story's heading and having an end goal ultimately. So there's five points that I like to consider among all storytelling in marketing, starting with authenticity. If you can communicate sincerity, which a lot of brands are doing really well at the moment, it gives you a great opportunity to, to show your customers how genuine you are and build that trust. And you have consistency, which is not to be confused with monotony and, and the, the same and regurgitating content a lot, but consistent in your brand, in your tone, having a personality, identifying that and knowing how to adapt that across different platforms with different moods. And personalization, again, now more than ever, we need to know who we're talking to. We need to have an understanding of the situation that they might be in right now and how we adapt our messaging according to that. Again, you might have a different audience on social media than you do on your email database um, or how LinkedIn differs from Twitter and you need to adapt your messaging accordingly. Then visualization, ultimately what we're all trying to do when we tell a story in any capacity is help people to visualize something, to bring something to life and shareability. If we can get other people to be telling our story for us, 
we're expanding our platform, we're widening our opportunity to market by thousands. So firstly, knowing your brand values. To keep your branding authentic and consistent, you've got to be clear on ultimately what your message is. And I know usually with marketing, the end goal nine times out of 10 is to sell, is to, to grow your revenue and to have your product, have people invest in your product, which is still true at the moment, but where your audiences aren't necessarily making purchases at the moment, they might not be booking a stay for now, or they might not be wanting to hold an event in the next few months. They're still there. And it's really important to understand that the people that you sell to are all still there and they're all still hearing and receiving what you're saying. So whether they're making a decision now or they're kind of learning to trust your brand, hearing what you're saying, finding it interesting and holding on to that for later down the line when they do need to make a booking, it's still incredibly important. So what are your brand values? What are the few things that through all of your messaging you're trying to communicate to people? That might be your commitment to your staff and your customers. Uh, we've seen quite a lot of examples in the news at the moment um, where brands haven't come out of this very well because of the way that they've treated their staff, um, their clients, their unforgiving cancellation policies and things like that. Or is it value? Are you all about value for money and what you can get added value from bookings? It's also important to understand what your brand values are and what they're not. So for example, a luxury brand that, that isn't all about value, you have to be careful in times like this not to devalue your values, as silly as that sounds. So for a luxury brand that's all about quality and, and service and authenticity and what you can offer, going out with a kind of a panic 50% off or an incredibly high deal, um, a flash sale, for example, can be at risk of devaluing the brand that you've worked so hard to create because your customers aren't stupid and they know a lot of the time what the implication of that is, why you're suddenly lowering your product to be so much cheaper. But there's a way of almost manipulating the messaging to to show your authenticity and, and whether that looks like, you know, we understand these times are hard, therefore we're offering, I don't know, one in five people this, or turning it around to show that your offer is, is for their benefit and not because you're panicking and need the money and, and kind of spreading that desperation almost. It could be your customer service, offering all those added values. So at the moment, lots of people are doing webinars, as I am, <laughs> or um, tutorials of showing you how to cook, how to do gardening, various things like that, and just demonstrating your worth. So one of the benefits of difficult times like this, um, there's few of them, but they are there. Crises give us a chance to prove so everything that I've just said about your brand values, you work for years and years to kind of portray your business as, as this, this great business with all these moral values. But it's times like these when they're actually put to the test. So one of these headings I saw in a hospitality title a few weeks back, hospitality heroes and villains emerge in COVID-19 pandemic. So why is it when we're all in the same boat, all businesses have been forced to close? Are there still some people coming out on top and some not coming out terribly well from all of this? Because people are handling it so differently. And that comes largely down to their messaging. So I'm sure a lot of you may have seen in the news recently some backlash from Britannia hotels. Um, they've not come out looking great, but just to give you a bit of a backstory if you're not familiar with it, there was a letter leaked from one of the staff at one of their hotels a few weeks back that was telling the staff that they've all been laid off with immediate effect. The opening line was services no longer required. The impersonal nature of how they're being told that they've lost their job, that they've lost their accommodation with immediate effect and that they'll have to repay all the money out of their salary from holiday that's no longer granted to them. Obviously hasn't made them look very good on social media. 
um, that's kind of spread like wildfire and the damage to their brand has been far greater than the problem itself. Although if you go onto their website, the second image you can see here on the screen, you see in very big letters, NHS and key workers accommodation. It sounds like a great thing to be doing. But unfortunately, that's got completely lost in the news because of their internal messaging. And you see that when you've not married up your internal messaging and your external messaging, unfortunately, the work for your external messaging has been completely undone. So you can see I've crossed out authenticity and consistency because when you're not consistent, that ultimately devalues your authenticity. So there's things that you have to stay consistent with, but there are variables, particularly in times like this. Articulating empathy, I've spoken on this before, but now more than ever before for a lot of us, it's really, really important to empathise in all of your messaging. And it's rare that there's something that find so many people globally with one thing that a lot of people have in common. And we can use that to relate to people on a level that we've never been able to before. Timing and relativity. Everyone knows how quickly things can change from the last few weeks. Um, timing particularly in terms of when you're sending out messaging, both emails, social media, whatever it is, Timing in one respect has, has relaxed. Um, we're used to so heavily scrutinizing open rates and the, the maximum time or the best time that we can send something out to get you know, the most people engaging and things like that. But we're seeing at the moment brands sending emails at five o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock at night, because ultimately we're all here, we're all in our homes, we're all online a lot of the time. But what it is worth considering is what people are doing at specific times of the day. So for example, the five o'clock updates that a lot of people are following very closely because of the personal implications, the implications on business that they have and how one small update can change so much and make so much no longer relevant. If you compose an email or some kind of newsletter at midday, for example, and you schedule that to go out at five o'clock, you might be sitting at home watching the update and, and working out how that affects business and things. But to the person receiving your email at that time, they're looking at you thinking, hang on, they're clearly not sat at home watching what's ultimately going to have a massive effect on this industry. And it kind of devalues what you're doing because they think you're not keeping that close eye on things. It's just having that awareness of, of what are people doing at that time of day and just kind of adapting according to that. Similarly, with a lot of our material, if we have to go through stages of, of proofreading internally, sending things to managers or different teams to check over, we just have to be really clear about the diminishing relativity the longer things go on. If you spend three days writing something that you've kind of perfected, and then just like that, it becomes irrelevant because of some new law that's being brought in or some dev key development that changes everything then it's not a good use of your time as well we need to vary content um, so i've talked about consistency not not being monotonous um, and that you can kind of like as a person we try and have hopefully one personality but with different moods so you can adapt that same personality to be recognized as a brand but you can, you can empathise to the situation and to the environment that you're in to adapt your messaging. One example I thought was quite a good illustration is <laughs> when we're all on Netflix and you get that incredibly judging screen pop up that says, are you still watching after three hours? Yes, we're all still watching, very aware and humiliated that we've been sat at our screen for six hours, glued to whatever the latest series is. But ultimately, why are we still watching other than the fact that we can't leave our houses and, and that's one of the only things to do? But I mean, you get to the end of season one of something and it rolls into season two. Why do we watch season two? Because we liked season one. But 
we want it to be the same in terms of quality, in terms of comedic value, in terms of action, suspense, whatever it is. But we obviously don't want it to be exactly the same as season one. We want it to be new and fresh. And that's the same in brand messaging with consistency and retention for your customers. We want to keep it the same, but different. So you have that consistency, that level of expectation from people. Once they start hearing from you in a certain way, in a certain tone of voice, in a certain manner, they will expect that from you going forwards. So if you write something that's particularly bad taste initially, that's tarnished people's, people's opinion of you in the same way that if you watch one episode of something on Netflix and you think it's terrible, you're unlikely to watch the next one. So it's kind of like a balancing act. You're different, but you're relevant. What I'd, I'd advise as a, a kind of little exercise to do with your messaging, when you have a story to tell, kind of write it up as a, a visual diagram of scales, bullet pointed scales on one side, how you're staying different, what your unique selling point is as a brand, what your angle is going to be that somebody else can offer. Somebody else, sorry, can't offer. So whatever it is, how small and insignificant you think it is, what is one thing that you can offer your customer that nobody else can? And that's all about finding your identity. And then on the other side of the scale, you've got keeping up with the latest trends, making it relevant both in the industry and beyond. I mean, right now, there's so much, uh, we're talking, there's a lot going on in hospitality. Um, and obviously, globally, as I said previously, there's something that, that kind of bonds everybody, unites every, everybody right now. So you find that hook that latches onto something that people are talking about, that there's other conversations going on around you, but you still need to be different within that. So writing with purpose, having your goal and identity established, we then need to find the appropriate words to convey your message in the way that you want it to be conveyed. So this definition of a word, a single distinct meaningful element of speech or writing used with others to form a sentence. I mean, ultimately it's making the point that every single word has, is, as, is as important as the next. So when we're watching the government um, updates, for example, we're listening to every word they're saying, hoping that it will bring some kind of hope or clarity or reassurance. But the wrong use of one word can be really detrimental to the way that the whole speech is received from us. The difference between a word like probably or possibly or definitely will change how much we trust that person or if it devalues everything they've just said to us. <laughs> so to write with purpose, we have to understand the purpose of words, which ultimately is to indicate similarities or differences. And in marketing, our role is very much to indicate the differences, but also to be very aware of the similarities that goes back to the balance we just spoke about. So what are your words? I find it really interesting to do this exercise with people on your website. So there are a couple of online free tools that basically let you count the words um, that are used on every web page on your website. So it's quite nice sometimes to, to talk about your brand personality, your values and everything that you're trying to be. So are you luxury? Is that what you're about? Or whatever it is, just writing a couple of words down on paper and then understanding the gap of how that marries up with actually how you've been communicating about yourself for the last few months, the last few years. Coming up with a physical list of the most used words on your website, if they're nothing to do with luxury, if you're talking about value, if you're talking about offers, deals, this and that, and things that, that aren't kind of what you're thinking you're portraying about yourself, then now's a really good opportunity to reassess your website, your whole messaging, um, and to really bridge that gap between, is it the brand's personality that you need to address your values? Are they, are they not realistic? Or is it your website that is the problem in just not communicating well enough what, what you're trying to convey? 
So getting really down into the detail about the types of words to help you stand out and really add value to your brand at the moment in terms of, of the way you can be marketing and people being so hesitant to receive the words that you're saying. At the moment, I know a lot of you, as I said at the start, are thinking, what are the right things to say? What should I not be saying? What's quite insensitive? What's inappropriate to just be hard selling when, when people don't have the money or the kind of reassurance to be spending? And I love this, this kind of breakdown of the difference between these skip words, for example. So many people are guilty of, of on their CVs, in their marketing materials, saying about how creative they are, how strategic they are, what an expert they are, responsible, effective, the list goes on. If we can adapt that and use this period at the moment to actually demonstrate, and it goes back to using crises to, to prove, the word prove, demonstrate, what are you actually doing to, to reinforce all of these values that you've claimed to have for however many years? So if you can change that word creative to say, we have created, and go on to talk about your story of whatever it is that you've created, or we've increased you know, the number of something if you're donating something at the moment or helping in some capacity, reduced, improved, they're all words that are actions. It sounds ironic saying actions speak louder than words, but ultimately we're using words to relay those actions and show what it is that, that we've done to, to, as I said, reinforce what is your brand and what actually is the evidence for, for what you're saying you are. I love this little word association game. I think it really clearly demonstrates how something so significant can be built from what you think is nothing. So a lot of people really struggle to have an idea because they don't know where to start. So if you sit down and think, okay, yeah, I get it. I need to tell a story about my brand. I need to keep it relevant. I need this, I need that. The importance of conversation to sit down with your team, whether that's on Zoom or on Teams and just talk. You might have no ideas to start with, but you'd be amazed at what can come from so little. So this game was asking people, to, just two people, you start with the word nothing. What's the next word that you think of? So that turned to air. Then someone said breathe and lung. Anyway, moves down to you get to royalty, which is ultimately a status of, you know, the highest form of superiority. So for something so kind of grand to be built out of literally nothing just makes that point that although you think there's nothing there to talk about, it doesn't take long before you can kind of build to that narrative and find layers and actually find something much more worth talking about. And I guess that comes down to creativity, which as research shows, a lot of people think the only reason that they're not creative is because they don't have the time to be. So 75% of people under, are under pressure to be productive rather than creative at work, or that's how they perceive it to be. At the moment, people have time in a way that they've potentially never had before. And we're seeing all types of creativity through Instagram challenges that people are setting, how to make a dress out of a pillow and make it look the most stylish. There are so many things that people are doing, thinking outside of the box to ultimately tell an interesting story, whether that's personally or as a business. So at the moment, everybody's working towards the same goal. How do I ensure that my business stands out once business resumes as, as normal, however that looks like? So you really need to get on board with, with the creativity train at the moment um, and finding that niche of how you can stand out and utilize the time that you've got as i said to just have conversations to just see what you can build for your messaging i've used this a couple of you might have heard me use this one before um, but there's a social psychologist called ellen langer and she's done a couple of experiments to look at the implication and the power of really specific words. So she did one experiment that was the psychology behind the word why. 
she basically approached a group of people that are standing in a queue to use a photocopier in their office. And she says the first time, excuse me, I have five pages, may I use the photocopier? To see how many people will let her butt in and go to the front of the queue. Then to the second group of people, she says, excuse me, I have five pages, may I use the photocopier because I'm in a rush? Fair enough, you know, if you're a fairly reasonable person, you might just let them nip in if they're not gonna be long. And then the third time she says, excuse me, I have five pages. May I use the photocopier because I have some copies to make? As does everybody else in the queue, hence why they're waiting to use the photocopier. But interestingly, 60% of people in the first group of people thought that was fair enough. Whatever, we'll just let her butt in. And 94% of the second group were okay with it compared to 93% on the third. So there's not much in it between the last two. The difference between them, the second two use the word because. They add in a reason, one of which I think is fair enough, one of which I don't think is reasonable at all, to be honest. But just giving a reason, people are okay with it. And I'm not saying you should have, have a nonsense reason in, in why you're telling the story that you are. But ultimately, if you want people to take action, always give a reason. So at the moment, that might not mean taking action in terms of making a booking, but whether it's just listening to what you say, or if the action is beginning to trust you as a business, as a hotel, as a venue, what is your reason? And if you don't have a reason, maybe you shouldn't just be talking for the sake of it. So word choice, again, some of the most persuasive words in the English language, one of which I've just discussed because you. Everybody likes to feel that they're the center of attention, that everything is being directed to them. And it's really important to remember in your messaging that as much as you're writing, you know, we're doing this, um, we're working on this initiative at the moment, we're doing this great work with charity, we're helping to do this, we've, we've made some you know, great adjustments in our business. If you can turn that round to, you will get this from you know visiting or we've done this for our customers you 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 it's just really small changes in words that can have a huge difference to how it's received and how it's read the other end um obviously free that's quite an obvious one because everybody loves something free especially at the moment when people are being really cautious about where their money goes then instantly new actually instantly is probably more relevant than ever because now that we're doing everything online, everything is instant. You can get whatever you need straight away, basically. Um, so it's just, just worth bearing in mind. And new as well, as I said earlier, people want something that's the same, but different. So what can you offer that's new? It's worth doing your research and reading what your competitors are doing and things like if you can offer a digital platform for people to, to run an event online. You might not think that that's new, but there might be a concept within that or an angle that you can take to position it in a way that is new. Some other words, um, you can, I can send this presentation to whoever needs it afterwards. Um, but introducing, amazing, inspires, tell us, just some additional examples of, of words that have proved some of the most persuasive in our language. Um, and then just looking very quickly at synonyms, so words that are very similar, but not quite the same, or to us what we think might be the same, but have a huge effect on, on the way that something is read and received. So I've just given two examples of the difference between two things. One being discover, which implies adventure, excitement, and one being learn, which is very educational and structured. Both fine, but it depends, depends what you're trying to communicate um, in your messaging. Another one, joining compared to signing up. If you're asking a customer to join something, it sounds like they're gonna be part of a community, that they're part of a wider body. Whereas signing up is very regimented, like you're enlisting for something. Just gonna look very briefly at, at data 
kind of as a catalyst for your storytelling and how at the moment, as I said, for those of you that do have extra time, research is just invaluable. Any information that you can amass over the next weeks to help with your marketing strategy going forward is going to add value. So whether that's surveys to your own customers, find out what it is at the moment that they're kind of they're wanting to see from you, what they're wanting to hear, what they're not wanting to hear, or just spending time re really going over reviews that they've left on TripAdvisor or on Google, or any information about how your marketing and your messaging has been received up until now will help you to adapt and expand that going forwards. And it shows that you're, you're listening to your audience. You want to understand what they want from you. So it prompts you to take action. It helps you to change people's perceptions of you. And it helps you to reevaluate the impact that your marketing and your messaging is having. So case studies and testimonials. I think a really good example, um, again, I've used this before, but recently I bought a pair of leggings online. Um, don't usually buy things online because especially leggings, girls will know you're very particular about a pair of leggings looking good, fitting well, making you feel like you want to actually work out. <clears throat> I bought this pair, thought they were amazing, tried them on and was actually really excited that they fitted perfectly, they were great quality, they were thick and I thought amazing, I'm going to leave a really good review about them online. Got distracted and I didn't. Anyway, I got pestered by the company about maybe five times with follow up emails telling me to leave a review. In the end, I got so annoyed by the repetition of them annoying me that I just left a one word like, yeah, great, thanks, move on. Because I didn't capture or they didn't capture from me the initial excitement that I felt and how much I was in love with my new pair of leggings, that just diminished over time. And by the time they actually captured that, that kind of feedback from me, that case study, that testimonial, it didn't, it didn't add much, to be honest. Um, and I think that's, it's really worth thinking about, perhaps not now, but going forwards, working out the messaging that you use after somebody stayed with you during a stay or after an event, again, during an event, like being a photographer when you you capture somebody in the moment at an event or at a wedding and you can see the kind of the happiness and the joy that that's brought to them it's not really the same as two months later saying oh can you just re-remember how much you enjoyed that event and just kind of look as happy as you did based on the experience that you had and i'll take a picture of it to show everybody what a great time you had so i think it goes back to timing after an event if you can capture the happiness of your client, the satisfaction that they have in that moment and put that down on paper, get them to send photos with permissions or whatever it is, or get them to leave you a review online. It's all about the timing of doing that. And if you can get positive testimonials, positive case studies, again, as I said earlier, you're expanding your storytelling to other people telling the story for you. And that adds so much value because people listen to, to other people that don't have an ulterior motive, that don't have an agenda to tell you how wonderful something is. Having said that, that's your strategy going forwards when you are up and running as a business, when you've got people coming in, coming through your doors. But at the moment, you can still check in with all of your customers and you can still update your case studies, make sure that your website filtering through reviews that have been left on TripAdvisor and things that are all still relevant to build your brand. And though people aren't booking at the moment, people are still remembering and they're still checking in, they're still visiting people's websites to get inspiration and for, for times in the future. So people, probably after all of this is over, are just going to really want to have a nice time to go and stay at a hotel. At the moment, people have the time to research to find the best hotel to stay at, to read people's reviews and actually make an informed decision. So if we have that already and kind of raring to go for when people can make the booking, we really shouldn't, shouldn't underestimate the value of the kind of 
the more silent marketing that we can be doing in the meantime. So as part of that, oh, sorry, um, engagement at the moment, as I mentioned, it's really, really important to remember that your audience is still there. They're not booking necessarily, um, but 45% of global consumers are spending more time on social media at the moment. So the platform has grown that you're able to talk to. 15% more people read magazines in March. So all the stories that you think aren't worth telling at the moment, um, they are because people are wanting to read them. Daily email open rates are generally increasing by five to 10% each week. So again, it's just reshaping the way that we are marketing, but not staying silent. Because as I've said, almost on every slide, people are still there. We're all at home. We're all in the same boat, but we are wanting to hear from people. We are wanting to still see what people have to offer. And it's worth just considering finally different platforms and the channels that you can be using to do that. So your messaging doesn't necessarily need to change, but needs to adapt according to the platform and the channel that you're using. So you might have one main story about an initiative that you're running at the moment or something that you're doing to help the NHS or the homeless or the wellness of your staff. You can filter that through onto your website into your internal communications with your teams, social media, e-comms, video, marketing materials, presentations, but that looks slightly differently according to the platform. And you need to understand the differences between your audience on each of those platforms and make sure that, for example, this webinar, if you were running a webinar like this, is the language that you're using and the messaging that you're conveying in line with your brand personality are the staff on board with understanding your values and what it is that you're trying to communicate so that you have that kind of that communal, that consistency throughout? Um, I think we're running out of time, so I won't go into to too much detail on that. Um, but just finally, a little toolkit checklist for you to really establish your branding, your values that I think is really integral to understanding how to communicate, how to share your messaging during this time and going forwards. <clears throat> so establishing your brand values, reviewing your website content, um, looking at the most used words, for example, and some of the tools that I shared, drawing up a tone of voice document. So just, you don't even have to have a reason for it, but if there's certain words that you really don't like being used in conjunction with your brand, that's fine. Document them, share them so that everybody has an understanding and is in the same boat on that and get to know your audiences know the difference between your social media followers your twitter followers your instagram followers and use that to your advantage on on the sensitivity of your messaging at the moment and and things like that going forward so thank you so much for listening um i just try to fit quite a lot into that but um i don't know if anybody any questions or if Georgia would like to take over. Thanks Anna. Um, so we've got a couple of questions for you um, just that we can run through if you're happy to. So um, in your opinion um, in terms of what you were saying earlier what do you think is the most powerful channel to communicate your message? Um, does it depend on the brand or do you feel that there is one channel that everyone should be focusing on? Yeah, I mean, at the moment, I'd recommend utilising every channel that you possibly can. <laughs> As I said just now, you need to tailor the messaging according to what channel it is that you're using. But I wouldn't necessarily say discount social media, um, focus on emailing. I mean, obviously, it, it depends on what your business is. It depends on, on what I said at the beginning. What is your goal? So social media, something like Instagram, we might say, for example, don't use that as a selling tool. It's not to direct people to your website to then click a link to, to make a booking. Mm. It's about sharing your, the personality of your brand. It's about brand awareness um, and, and what you can kind of share with your customers that is useful for them. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite a difficult question to answer without knowing the objective. 
but it's worth having your objective for each kind of bit of messaging or channel um, and listing kind of which channel works with with which really yeah no that makes sense um and then i think we've got time we can just do one more quickly um how important do you think it is to share um your employee news um do you think people um care about it do you think that um people should be doing more of it um what do you think about in terms of obviously taking that internal news externally especially at times like this yeah i think um I mean, obviously, there's a difference between your internal communication and your external. But as the example with Britannia Hotel showed, there can be crossover when you haven't asked for it and you haven't wanted it. So if you have an opportunity to communicate your internal messaging or great things that your staff are doing now more than ever, people want to see the human side of a brand and people are going through difficult times and want to know that brands that they're investing money in that their hotels they're staying with venues that they're they're working with are treating their staff well mm, the customer service that they see and are offered is kind of mirrored with their own staff so i think yeah you see a lot of at the moment um team selfies on on zoom and things like that that just is all part of that showing the personality side of things um so i think i mean within reason not making your staff uncomfortable with having to share personal things that, that you know they don't want to um but any initiatives that you can be sharing just to show that you're making the best out of a bad situation at the moment um i think can really really help build trust brilliant well thanks so much anna um i hope everyone um enjoyed that as much as uh, i did i mean i have seen it a few times and it just gets better <laughs> Um, so I just thought um, it's quite good to just um, obviously mention to you again that this is being recorded and this will be available to all of you that have registered. So uh, please don't worry if you've uh, missed out on anything or feel that you need to uh, listen to the narrative again. It'll be available to you directly and we'll also add it to YouTube. So you should be able to um, view it either way. Um, I've just sent a link around to everyone, um, as well as we're doing these weekly masterclasses, we're now doing a weekly hospitality marketing bulletin, um, which covers all of the key things that we feel that the industry should be aware of, uh, the hot headlines for the week, the key events and webinars we feel that people should be attending, and also the key insights that are coming out, um, covering everything from SDRs, regular webinars, to um, UK hospitality changes, uh, MIA changes in terms of their research for their members. So um, if you would like to receive that on a weekly basis, uh, please sign up on the link below. We'll also share an email with it for you as well. Um, so this is probably a good opportunity to talk about our next masterclass. Um, so we are, like I said, doing these weekly. So next Wednesday on the 22nd of April, we are going to be joined by Adam Hamadash, who is the CEO of DHM, the Direct Hotel Marketing Agency, uh, Digital Hotel Marketing Agency, I should say, sorry. Um, so uh, registration details will be available for that very soon. And he will be covering the digital marketing must that you need to have in place during this time, and how you can be better prepared with your digital strategy um, before the lockdown is finished. Um, so just want to provide a note um, and say thank you for joining. Um, obviously our website is available for all uh, regular updates, uh, whether that's in interesting articles, news, um, and that's where all the information will be for our upcoming webinars. So again, thank you for joining us. And we hope to see you at one of our masterclasses very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you.